everybody in. Yes. Call to order the meeting of the Common Council for Tuesday, December 17, 2019. Clerk. 11 are present, Your Honor, with Alder Nicholson excused. We have a quorum and we'll proceed. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for the invocation offered by Alder Burnett. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank, uh, thank you, Mayor. If I, if I could ask to speak at the podium. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity to lead the invocation, Mayor. Mayor. Uh, it's one that I wrote. shouldn't take any longer than 35 to 45 minutes, so <laughs> get, get comfortable. We don't have anywhere to be. It, it's a little wordy, but hope it's well received. Um, please bow your heads if you'd like. Father, our Common Council meets today during the season of Christmas, a time in which peace, love, joy, compassion, hope, and faith are held sacred in many hearts and minds. Throughout our city, we bear witness to the tremendous power people of faith, but also those without faith, but of goodwill, possess in providing charitable works and extending mercy, love, and care to those in need. We are thankful. We, we pray for peace and understanding between all people for all times, not just during the Christmas season. We come before you with a spirit of gratitude. Thank you for our abundant blessings. Thank you for life itself, for good health, for family, and for friendship. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing appropriate responsibilities. We recognize that serving in a position of civil leadership comes with the duty to do what is right and just, not only for those we represent, but also the greater community. On behalf of those assembled here, I humbly pray for our mayor, fellow city council members, and for our municipal judge. Let it be, we pray, that those in leadership possess the wisdom to govern amid the conflicting interests and issues of our time and cultivate the ability to work together in harmony even when there is honest disagreement or differences between people. We thank and appreciate all of our dedicated city employees who work hard to provide needed municipal services to our community. We hope they feel our gratitude for the necessary work they complete, which unfortunately sometimes goes unnoticed and unappreciated. We pray that a hand of protection be placed on our public works employees, our police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and all other first responders who selflessly serve all children, women, and men without hesitation. Please keep them safe and provide their families peace of mind as their loved ones are on duty, completing the often dangerous work for which they have been called. Finally, for those in this room today and throughout our city who may not feel warmth this Christmas season, perhaps due to poor health, loneliness, financial concerns, hunger, or any other personal struggle, we pray that they are reconciled to their past with a certain measure of peace, that they feel a sense of joy in the present, but also realize eternal hope for a brighter future. Open our eyes to their struggles, and through our words and actions and faith and goodwill, let us work together to build a wonderful future for all people of Green Bay and beyond. Pleasing to you. Amen. Thank you, Alder. Approval of the minutes. Motion by Alder from the first, second by Alder from the second uh, to approve the minutes. Any corrections that need to be made? Seeing no requests, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Ayes have it. The minutes have been approved. Approval of the agenda. Moved by Alder from the seventh, seconded by Alder from the sixth. Yes, Alder from the fourth. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'd like to move um, N up in front of L. N as in Nora, up in front of L. So there would be uh, protection and policy. Protection and policy. Got it. All right. Motion was made by Alder from the fourth and seconded by Alder from the ninth, I believe. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. With that change made to the agenda. On to the report by the mayor. Just a couple quick items here. One sort of housekeeping related. Um, we have distributed to Alders the schedule for our council meetings for the upcoming year. Uh, this is an informational item, uh, not something that is voted on here at, at our council, but just wanted to, to let you know that um, that has been provided to you all. If you haven't seen it, um, I think Chief of Staff Jeffries has provided a, a paper copy to you as well. Um, a rationale has been provided, which is required, has been provided to the, um, to the clerk's office. So if you have any questions about that, you know, please, um, you can talk to me or the clerk or our Chief of Staff with those questions. Um, and then just a, a quick note on an event coming up. As, as you all know, we have the New Year's Rock and Eve every year on the, on the 31st, thanks to U.S. Bank, who is the primary sponsor there. Just wanted to highlight that for you and your families, uh, for alders and, and, uh, and community members. Really appreciate the, the family friendliness of that event and the fact that it's been going on for so many years here. Would encourage people to, uh, to check out what's going on, hop on Facebook or, or their website and get more details. But um, a ton of different events, uh, y YMCA downtown and, and other community partners, uh, very supportive of that effort. So thankful to them. And again, encouraging you all to, uh, to take part. And that con uh, concludes my report. On to announcements. Alder from the ninth. Thank you, Mary. I just want to take an opportunity. I know um, uh, the Department of Community and Economic Development, is specifically uh, neighborhood associations, Green Bay Neighborhoods, hosted uh, their annual Christmas party slash meeting uh, the other week. And in particular, I'd like to recognize uh, Tank Park Neighborhood Association, who was the recipient of the Phoenix Award. They were one of two neighborhood associations that were resurrected in my district this past year. Um, that was one of my priorities, is to attempt to resurrect all of them. So I want to just give a shout out to Will Peters uh, from city staff, who has been very hard at work on that. And again, uh, Lily and Ann and Crystal and, and some of the others with Tank Park Neighborhood Association for their recognition uh, and the hard work that they're doing. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder from the 6th. Yes, Mayor, thank you. Um, I would also like to uh, give a shout out to the East Shore Drive Neighborhood Association. They received the uh, Communication Award from the uh, Neighborhood Leadership Council. Um, it, 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 what they did is they put out on the, uh, we have our open door, and it was the fire that happened on Wisconsin Avenue the, when the, the little child died, and we put out a request for funds. And we raised over, I think it was over $2,000 from the neighborhoods, from one end to the other, people gave to, uh, to help the family. So that was one thing that we did. And then um, I also, I gotta apologize, I rushed tonight and I forgot to bring, I had made Christmas cards for all the alders, for the mayor, the staff, and all the staff people here, their department heads and staff. So I will drop them off, I'll put the alders in their mailboxes, they can get them whenever, and then for, I'll drop off for all the department heads and everything, because I think they do a really good job in this city, and uh, unfortunately, I had, did not win the lottery, so I can't give them a bonus. <laughs> If ever I do, maybe, but um, I just wanted to thank them for their, all their service and everything. And then uh, the last thing, I did send, I did give everybody a sheet on the sidewalk uh, cafe ordinances. I just want everybody to read A. And um, I contacted the Wisconsin Municipality Association to have a question on it. And I also, um, let's see, I had some other people had to check with but I also have to do one more thing I have to check with the Brown County uh, Health Department I believe they're the ones who give out the the restaurant uh, licenses and this is in regards to um, title town tobacco and I don't believe they meet this <coughs> ordinance and so I will have to after I find out to make sure they do not have a valid restaurant license I will put a communication into Alder Scandals Committee protection and policy because um, I was advised it has to go back to the committee and then come back to the full board 
So um, I will be doing that. I just want everybody to read this and be aware that this is coming up, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Any other announcements? Alder from the 8th. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First, Merry Christmas, Mr. Mayor and the Council. Um, my comments would be, I guess, in, in our announcement here, since it really wasn't an agenda item, is the committee or the, the council meeting schedule. I've talked on this numerous times. 24 times a year, if we met twice a month, would be the max we could meet. You know, and I've seen this, you know, we used to take maybe July off, maybe December, January, something like that. Um, and now it's down to um, seven months out of the year we meet once. So those months, if somebody has an item, and it's important to them, no matter what it is, if they're appealing or a liquor license, uh, development, if they put it in, let's say, the day after a council meeting, they have to wait a full month to get it done. And that's, talk about the wheels of bureaucracy. I, I just think if you could maybe look at it and see if we can put some of these back, because we're only meeting, I think, Tw uh, 16 times next year uh, you know that's that's not very many so just my two cents thanks appreciate that Alder thank you Alder from the 10th thank you your honor uh, just piggybacking on what Alder Burnett said um, at the invocation I just like to wish everybody a Merry Christmas happy holiday and for all your families and friends that the, you're all safe in this time of this this great time uh, my daughter's coming home from Germany for 10 days so I'm looking forward to that and just uh, have a blessed and, and safe uh, holiday season. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Any other announcements? Alder from the 7th. Simply. Everybody, everybody pressing their buttons tonight? I got my press. Okay, sounds good. Randy pushes buttons. <laughs> <laughs> ah, just to one and all, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and ho, ho, ho. Ooh, wow. Thank you. Short and sweet. Any other announcements? <laughs> All right, with that, we are on to presentations. So I would invite Julie Nordyke to the podium. Um, she's the Water Quality and Coastal Communities Outreach Specialist at the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant Institute. And she's going to present us um, with some information on green infrastructure and the code audit, which is uh, ongoing here in the city of Green Bay. Julia. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, it went to sleep. Hold on a second. <clears throat> Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, sure. Um, I, um, I'm going to talk to you uh, briefly. So my name is Julia Nordyke. I work for the University of Wisconsin Sea Grant. I'm an outreach specialist for water quality and coastal communities. Uh, and I'm also on the Sustainability Commission. And so tonight I'm going to talk to you, I'm gonna give you a, an overview and a brief uh, background about a, a project coming up with the city uh, that we're working on related to green infrastructure and codes and ordinances. Uh, Celestine just handed out a postcard. <clears throat> you also received the link to the, the audit workbook tool in, in your uh, pre-meeting documents I'm assuming so you can download it I do have some uh, physical copies too if you're interested uh, but you probably want to love code language if you are so <laughs> um, but I, I please if you would like to see one in uh, the physical I can give those out too actually um, <clears throat> okay so um, what we're gonna, let's see, I'm gonna jump right in uh, and talk a little bit about uh, stormwater and why this is an important project for the Sustainability Commission and, and the city. Uh, so traditionally we have, we our stormwater, when it snows and it, the snow melts or it rains, we have, we, it goes down into the gutter and then it goes down into the storm drain. And this is the, our gray infrastructure system. It goes into the stormwater sewer system and then eventually it goes into our nearest body of water, a creek, a river, or e even the lake specifically. Um, and why this can be a problem is it picks up all sorts of things uh, on its way to this to our, our river. So there's a lot of this, this is visible, this is all the dirt and grime that's coming off our streets and our parking lots and our roadways, uh, but there's a lot that's going in there that's also we just can't see. 
And so there's, this is picking up things from like our dust, uh, dust, the brake dust, which is copper. So we have a lot of heavy metals. We have bacteria. We have um, lots of chemicals. Um, I think t this evening we're going to talk about polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the PAHs tonight. Those are things that are going into our water bodies. And so stormwater is, goes into our water bodies untreated. And we know that Lake Michigan and the Bay of Green Bay is one of our greatest resource natural assets here. So we want to think about ways that we can, that we can uh, help protect them. <clears throat> So, there, so those are traditional gray infrastructure, and we definitely need gray infrastructure in our city systems. Um, but there's also new, newer and uh, uh, new ways to think about our stormwater rather than just as a waste product and trying to get it off the land into the stormwater sewer s away from the property is it's green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is using natural hydrological processes to manage our stormwater on the site where it falls. So where that raindrop hits the ground or where the snow melts is we want to keep that water and infiltrate it into the ground or retain it and, and let it evaporate and the plants take it up. I put this picture on here. This, is a, uh, this was a formerly a brownfield site <clears throat> in Milwaukee in the Menominee Valley uh, the, near the Brewers Stadium or the Yes, Miller Park. I should know that. <laughs> um, Miller Park. Um, and they redeveloped it as a sustainable business economic development uh, area. It houses 14 large businesses, 1,400 employees at this point. But all the, all, those, all the hard surfaces and the parking and parking lots, it all drains into this treatment stormwater uh, wetland system here, and then eventually goes to the Menominee Valley. They integrated uh, walking trails, and the, this is the Hank Aaron State Trail, uh, so really became part of a community asset and using those natural cycles uh, to um, improve and reduce water pollution. Uh, some of the things we consider green infrastructure uh, include rainwater harvesting, so most people are most familiar with rain barrels. I, um, at their house, uh, but we can also use larger systems like cisterns. Uh, these are from the 35th Avenue viaduct in, in the Menominee Valley. Uh, there's two of these, and they capture 68,000 gallons of stormwater every year uh, from, from that uh, highway. We also have rain gardens and bioretention. In Green Bay, we typically call them more bioinfiltration systems. They're kind of like what they sound like. They're depressions in the ground, and they collect the stormwater and allow it to infiltrate into the ground or evaporate into the air, or the plants take it up. Uh, so this one is actually locally. This is Sisters of St. Francis, uh, the Holy Cross on Nicolet Drive. Uh, this is their rain garden. <clears throat> this is also at St. Mary's Hospital down the street, uh, and this is coming off a parking lot. So you can see that the, the, when it's raining, the, the sediments and stuff are collecting in that four bay uh, and before they go into the garden. And so this is infiltrating into the ground rather than going into the stormwater system. We also have bioswales, so these are more linear features that convey the water, so you can imagine uh, down the street. So the, the planted area is what would be planted. I just showed this as a good <clears throat> uh, example of how it would be constructed. It's to slow the water down. So that's really important for uh, thinking about quantity and flooding areas too. We want to slow the water down rather than uh, um, conveying it really fast into our stormwater systems. Permeable pavements and pavers. There is a lot of technology around this stuff. It's where the rather than um, you can see the traditional paved asphalt is in the in the in the upper piece, and then the permeable stuff. So it infiltrates the rainwater, and you can see that the water's not sticking on the ground. Uh, here's an example of a, a permeable alleyway. So there's all different types of pavers and pavement and asphalts that are permeable. Locally here, if you want to check one out, is at the Brown County Ashwaubenon branch. This is a product called Pave Drain. Um, and they have just selected a small strategic area around their storm drain to install this. Uh, we have in ur denser urban areas, we have planter boxes and things that we can put on sides of the building uh, and so forth like that. So this captures all the rainwater coming off the roof. Green roofs and walls, uh, thinking about aesthetics and how can we use that rainwater coming off our roofs as a resource. This is a green roof, uh, so the medium's put down on top of the roof. Uh, it comes with various benefits that include energy efficiency for buildings that have them on there. Does anyone recognize where this one is? St. Mary's? <laughs> no, this is not St. Mary's. Oh. 
<laughs> St. Mary's was my first uh, cover picture. This is the city hall of De Pere. Okay, <laughs> so just put that in. <laughs> um, but St. Mary's does have a wonderful green roof that's publicly available, and I do highly encourage you to visit it. And it's they use it as a public health um, uh, benefit too. Stormwater trees. So these are specifically designed trees to allow root systems underneath the sidewalks and roads. Uh, so you know more root systems, healthier trees, and they soak up a lot more rainwater and snowmelt than a traditional street tree would. And they last a lot longer, so your arborist is going to be a lot uh, uh, much happier. Uh, thinking about replacing turf grass with deep-rooted or native plants. So this is um, a house that has completely replace their lawn with these. Um, and here's another example just locally too. The Sisters of St. Francis of Holy Cross also have, uh, they just have a dedicated trail mode, but most of their property is under native and deep-rooted vegetation. Uh, and these are really powerful because it really soaks in that water into the ground rather than having it run to the local storm system. Another thing to think about too in terms of green infrastructure, bigger landscapes. So restoring floodplains and, wetland and, and wetlands. Um, this is outside of Ann Arbor. Uh, this is a storm, this is a, a 70 acre or 81 acre park. Uh, what you're seeing is actually, I'm standing on a walking trail at this point, uh, but it is also functions as a stormwater detention basin and also reduces the pollution going into the creek by 25%. So uh, really something that functions as both a stormwater management tool, but also a really nice community asset. So why do, green, why do codes and ordinances matter for green infrastructure? Well, as you know, it being council um, members, that um, s codes and ordinances really dictate a lot of our community services here. The, the design and standards for road widths, um, things that impact public safety and health, uh, the maintenance of public and private property, and, and codes and ordinances even set forth the structure for uh, government processes and procedures and decision making. So, most, a lot across the country, a lot of our codes and ordinances were developed at a time uh, when the impact of local land use and, uh, was not, and development was not understood on our water resources. So they're very outdated. We have found examples of you know, how to hook up your horse properly downtown or, <laughs> or different parking ratios for men's and women's department stores. Uh, so needless to say that our codes really do need updating to deal with our current stormwater management problems. Um, currently. Um, and so also the absence of the words green infrastructure or these types of practices within the codes and ordinances can really be a barrier too. So if city staff uh, is interpreting processes and procedures to determine site planning, for example, if it's not even mentioned, it's not going to be considered by developers or, or within potentially within city staff. So do codes and ordinances actually really matter for water quality? So we understand that it's kind of ambiguous. So what we set out to do is also uh, kind of demonstrate the impact of codes and ordinances on water quality. So this is an example. This is for the folks who are the planners who love that code language. This is an example of a code ordinance change within a community that would allow permeable surfacing in driveways and alleyways. And it just requires that they, they it's upon review and approval by the village engineer. And you can see that this is a, this this uh, small alleyway captures 25,000 square feet of drainage area, and you can see the significant runoff pollution uh, reductions that come from, from this area. This is another example using uh, just the encouraging the use of natives and deep-rooted plants in lawn areas and limiting the total percent of turf site of a turf grass. Um, so this is a 1.74 acre site, commercial site, and if you just replaced the grass alone with native vegetation, you would uh, reduce pollution by 74, the volume of pollution by 74% and the actual total suspended solids, the dirt and the grime, uh, by 64%. That is a significant amount, and that's without adding other stormwater best practices. And then the last one I'll share with you um, is enabling shared parking. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, we're, 
a lot of our problems come from lots of parking and there are there have been many studies to show updated parking ratios and then also opt uh, when demand is needed so thinking about this is a really a code that's really important to look at in terms of reducing those hard impervious surfaces that contribute all that stormwater runoff uh, and so in this case this is allowing um, the applicant to submit a parking analysis and plan to the plan commission for approval um, and really doing an analysis of what the demand is for for parking at a specific area and and this is also just uh, the pollution reduction is just for the impervious surface reduction alone and not it, once you add in potential bioretention or other types of stormwater management uh, that that reduction goes up over 50% So I really want to point out that this isn't about more cost or regulation at all. We, um, a lot of times when places get redeveloped and developed, we, lands, parking lot landscaping for, in this example is required. Uh, somebody's spending money on these things to do with them. We know water does not run uphill. And so there is alternatives that we just can think really a lot smarter about when we're making land use decisions and, and things that are being required as part of development to begin with. Um, so this is an example of a, a small bioswale or bioretention cell uh, for a parking lot. Um, and it really does make a difference. Um, simple things within the codes and ordinances can make big impacts on our water quality and quantity um, issues, and they really do add up. And so the, um, this, uh, so the mayor's office submitted a grant to the Great Lakes Commission uh, for a green infrastructure champions grant, and they received $15,000 to do a code audit. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the code audit. And it's to, the code audit is to really analyze the codes and ordinances here in Green Bay and, and look for barriers to implementing green infrastructure practices and then also look for opportunities to reduce and improve water quality. <clears throat> so for example, uh, some of those things that we mentioned earlier. What makes this audit really unique is it's it's about the community. Uh, it's not it's a no judgment approach. It's a, we understand that codes and ordinances uh, and communities are really unique themselves, uh, and so this really takes a look at what. Green Bay wants and what their goals are. We look at things like what are our natural assets here? What do we care about protecting uh, as a resource? What are, what are our hazards? How do we deal with them? Where can codes and ordinances improve some of our hazards areas for the future? What's our community identity and character? Are there already green type initiatives that are going on that really would benefit from green infrastructure implementation and practices and be advocates for this kind of uh, project? What are our stormwater permit needs and pollution limits here? We definitely have them. <laughs> so uh, we, you know, hopefully we can uh, work on identifying codes that actually help with our, our, permit, permit, our permits. What are our current and future development needs? Uh, in built out areas, we might be focusing more on those planter areas, enabling shared parking, um, permeable materials, and things like that. Uh, maybe in areas that we're looking for future development that are open, we think about subdivision, uh, um, subdivision standards, road widths, cul-de-sac uh, cul widths, and things like that. Where can we save hard surfaces? So I'll just end with uh, this is very much a community-based approach, and there's no model ordinance. Uh, so this is going to be a really comprehensive audit. At the end of the audit, the consultant will have a list of recommendations, and I have identified the barriers. Uh, and then it's kind of up to the city, their staff, and all the people that were engaged in the project to move forward and decide for um, what codes and ordinance should be amended. So um, with that, I will uh, thank you again, and I'll take any questions you have. Um, so thank you. Thanks so much for that presentation. Any questions from the council? No questions? Great. Well, thanks so much for, oh, yes, Alder from the first. I just want to say thank you. Um, it was a really good presentation. I enjoyed it. I'm thinking right away about, how we don't have a lot of boulevards in Green Bay, but what if in our boulevards we just didn't have all that grass, we had some native grass or something. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> Is it really right? <laughs> what if in our boulevards we planted native grasses and then we wouldn't have to cut them 
And we, you know, I'm just, it's, it's just got me thinking of all kinds of things we could do for sustainability. So just thank you so much for putting this together. It was very interesting. That's Alder from the Sixth. I know Julie, and she always does an excellent presentation. She's very knowledgeable, and I thank her for coming. But I also want to say in my, I have a huge lot, and we have a lot of replanted, replanted trees. We lost 21 elms. We replanted, not 21, but we replanted trees because we know the value of the trees. And uh, my yard uh, does drain very well. We have a lot of swells, big ones, <laughs> big dips in it. Drains very well. And I've also taken out a lot of grass, and I think I'm going to do more, take more grass out. My husband likes grass, but no, I'm not going to. I'm going to take more grass out. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Any further questions? Alder from the 10th. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, very nice, very nice presentation, Julie. I was just ask. Right. I just wanted to know if you had a, a PDF of that. Uh, yes. Uh, I, don't, uh, I didn't see it on here. Did you? Was it emailed? Thank you. And then Thank the you postcard over. has the website where you can find it and download it there. You. Does anybody want a physical copy? All right. Any other questions? Very good. Thanks so much for the presentation. Thanks for your service on Sustainability Commission. Thanks for all your expertise you've offered to, to our office. Really appreciate all the work. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Same to you. And we are on to appointments. Motion made by Alder from the 7th. Second. Seconded by Alder from the 5th to confirm the appointment of election officials pursuant to section 7.30 Wisconsin statutes for the 2020-2021 term. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. You guys have it, and that item has been approved. On to public hearings. Uh, we have one item for public hearings. Is there anyone here who would like to speak to this item? Anyone here who would like to speak to this item? Is there anyone here who would like to speak to this item? Seeing no speakers, we'll close the public hearing. Clerk, please let the record reflect that no one appeared to speak to this item. And now we're on to ordinances, second reading for adoption. Motion, adopt. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, second by Alder from the 9th to adopt item K1. Please use the board. is 11-0. So now we are on to item N, Report of the Protection and Policy Committee. Motion, by, motion made by Alder from the 9th, seconded by Alder from the 10th to approve Report N, which is the Report of the Protection and Policy Committee from the meeting on December 9, 2019. 
Any items under this report you wish to handle separately? Item two. Two. Right. Items two and three will be handled separately. Hearing none others, all in favor of the remainder of that report, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The report has been approved with the exception of items two and three. On item two, all from the fourth. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to open the floor for. Uh, what's that? Oh, uh, yeah. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. I, I wasn't where he wanted to speak. That's why, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Director Grenier. We took a look at the processes and the materials that we're using within the Department of Public Works, uh, mm -hmm. and we don't think this is going to have any negative impact uh, on our operations. From the Public Works perspective, we definitely uh, strongly endorse this action uh, and feel that reduction of the poly uh, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons in the environment would be a good thing. So DPW is on board with this. Thanks, Director. So Motion to open the floor. Second. Motion made by Alder from the fourth, seconded by Alder from the seventh to open the floor. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The floor is open. Right. And just please state your name and address. Hi, good evening, Council members. Uh, my name is John Richards. I work with uh, Lakeshore Natural Resources Partnership and Clean Wisconsin. My address is 1700 North Farwell Avenue in Milwaukee. And good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Kettler. I'm the director of projects at the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership. And my address is 7003 Cedar View Road in Cleveland, Wisconsin. We'll give a brief presentation tonight and then be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, we're asking you to consider a ban on coal tar sealants and high PAH sealants. Uh, sealants are typically used to uh, cover driveways and parking lots to more of a decorative feature than anything else, but they, these products have a very, very negative impact on our environment. They release a chemical called uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And I gotta be honest with you, before I started working on this project, I didn't know what that was. Um, but I've, I've come to look at the research and, and found out that PAHs are similar to PC, PCBs and DDTs. And um, what the U.S. Geological Survey has found is as the level of PCBs and DDTs has dropped in waterways around the country, the level of PAHs has definitely gone up in waterways around the country. And that's true in Wisconsin and it's true here in Green Bay. Clean Wisconsin did a series of tests on the waterways in Green Bay and at nine sample sites, um, they found PAH levels at at least worrisome levels. So what that tells you is that uh, people are using coal tar sealant in the city of Green Bay. It's already impacting your waterways and we're asking for you to take action on that tonight. Um, the significance of PAHs is that they uh, can be uh, very cancerous especially for children. Uh, I handed out a, a packet to you that with a number of scientific studies, one of those studies shows that um, people who have a lifelong exposure to parking lots and driveways with uh, high pH coal tar sealant applied to them have a cancer risk that is 38 times higher than, than average. Uh, another study shows that for children, that rate is 14 times higher than average. And so uh, it's a very serious health concern um, that can be easily corrected. Another item that I have in the pack that I handed out to you this evening is a list of alternative products that can be used for sealant um, after you pass this ban. Um, if you look, the, 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 th the standard that we're asking you to pass is a ban on coal tar sealants of 0.1% of concentration in the product. So everything uh, that you see 
uh, above that mark is allowed. You can see a number of named products that are available today that, are, uh, uh, that would be allowed to be used. As you heard from uh, Director Grenier, uh, the city of Green Bay uh, doesn't use these anymore. And uh, what we're finding as we've gone around Wisconsin is that most communities are like Green Bay and that uh, the DPWs have stopped using this product a long time ago. And uh, you'll hear tonight from uh, some people who work in the private sector who will talk about their experience with coal coal tar sealant and we'll urge you to take this action tonight and with that I'll turn it over to Jim just to let you know that uh, we've been working on this issue for the last couple of years and started in Port Washington with them passing an ordinance in the early part of 2018 uh, Sheboygan Manitowoc Sturgeon Bay have all passed this ordinance and what we'd want and Plymouth just recently indeed and Sturgeon Bay in fact just recently and we want to bring a couple of folks up that will, I think, provide some compelling testimonials, uh, folks that actually work in the industry. And with that, I'd like to introduce Pat, uh, who runs his own coal or sealant uh, business. And uh, he has given up on coal tar based sealants uh, a number of years ago. And so I'll turn it over to Pat. Thank you. If you sir, if you could just state your full name and your address for us. Okay, my name is Patrick DeJardin, address E783 Town Hall Road. It's in Luxembourg. Um, to start, uh, my business has been around for about 30 years. It's a family business. I'm getting it from my father. Um, he has stopped using coal tar products for the last 12 years. Um, when I first started working with my dad, I had to use coal tar for only one year, thankfully. In that year, as an applicator that using this product, you are susceptible to chemical burns. You're susceptible to, like pain in the eyes because it's very like caustic in the air especially during application so at that time seeing as I was taking over the business my dad wanted to you know try to find an alternative product so we started switching and 12 years ago we did finally make it and since then the products have nothing but improved so as an applicator to get rid of coal tar it was easy for us then and it's even easier to do now because it's been like I said nothing but improved and their formulas and um, in terms of cost or anything like that that would Im impact us as contractors is very minimal um, we're talking five ten percent at most and it's less than the cost of a gallon of gas for a gallon of sealer so um, you can do a lot with it and I've done numerous parking lots high traffic low traffic houses residentials I've done work in Green Bay Shawano Manitowoc, Sheboygan, I've done it everywhere. Um, the alternatives perform just as well. There is no real reason from a contractor's perspective that I myself would want it around and there's other contractors in the field that um, in the respective cities like Manitowoc, the one over down there and up in Sturgeon Bay and that, but those who have made the switch, there's no regrets. Um, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, making the switch was a little harder because the products weren't performing. You know, it was coming off of driveways after you apply it. People don't like that. And, um, and one last thing. Recently, I don't know if any of you remember this last summer, there was radio ads, there was TV newscasts of people getting ripped off in regards to the asphalt industry, like elderly people getting charged three thousand dollars for a driveway that's the length of this room which is absolutely absurd um, from a contractor's standpoint everybody that rips people off uses coal tar because it is that five ten percent cheaper and when they're ripping people off they're not in it to give anybody any extras if you want to look at it like that so um, from a contractor's point of view all these people that are going around and they're taking advantage of elderly and they have unregistered businesses they just have a couple buckets in the back of their truck so on and so forth um, by enacting a coal tar ban you're cutting out the unlicensed uninsured I guess the bad seeds of the business and the professionals which there are plenty of us I, tr I can promise you that there will be having more business and will be putting money back into the state because a lot of these people that do come and rip you off they're not from around here. We've seen Illinois license plates, Nevada license plates, Indiana license plates, and they're all using coal tar. So in that regards, I think 
banning coal tar is pretty much a straight no-brainer at this point in time. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. <coughs> and I'd also like to introduce John Richards, who's a retailer of uh, different products. And John? It's actually John Schneider, but that's okay. John, John Richards, <laughs> that's no problem. Um, <laughs> you. Yes. So um, I, uh, your address? I operate in. Uh, Sir, in, you can just state your address as well. Yeah, sixty six seventy four Covered Bridge Trail in Sun Prairie. Um, I have a business, a manufacturing facility in Nacida, Wisconsin. Um, we've been manufacturing um, an asphalt emulsion, which is one of the products that will is replacing the coal tar um, product. Um, our product has zero point zero pause, so polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons do not exist in our product. Um, Pat actually uses another product that is not ours, but it's another one that has, I believe, 0, 0.0 or very close to it. So there are products out in the marketplace um, that do replace coal tar and, and at a very high level. And Pat's right. Back 12, 15 years ago, um, the emulsions that were on the market, the asphalt emulsions that were used as sealants, um, were, were really in their infancy. They were just kind of developing and they didn't actually perform as well as they do today. And the people who that were applicating them were, were very used to applicating coal tar. And there's a difference, a little bit of manipulation that may be a bit different and, and able to, um, if you do it, if you understand the product that you're laying down, you're able to get great results. At that time, people weren't really understanding the product. So a combination of not as quality of product and applicators not having as much education on the product um, cause for failures. And it's, I think that's one of the reasons why it's been a bit of a slow adapter um, in some states where they haven't um, uh, banned coal tar. Uh, we have seen uh, great uh, strides with our contractors throughout the state of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Minnesota is a state in which has banned coal tar entirely. Um, and the, those seal coaters that are in those areas, those applicators, have come to love uh, the asphalt emulsions. They do not burn your skin. Pat had mentioned that, that it's a, um, it's a, it's a very caustic sub substance. Um, and in fact, the pH levels in coal tar are about 70,000 to 100,000 parts per million. Um, if you think about asphalt itself, asphalt does have a little bit of coal tar in, or a pH and it's 1.5 part per million. So basically non-existent. Um, but 70,000 to 100,000 parts per million. There's not an, another product that's really used on a wide scale throughout this nation, throughout the world, that has that sort of a high concentration of coal tar. Not to mention, people are spreading this product um, over hundreds, millions of square feet of pavement. And in fact, there was a couple photos that I saw in the presentation that showed a black runoff going in there. And that is a lot of times coal tar. Um, and that runoff is then going in the water, water race. And, and one of the reasons why coal tar and PAHs are so problematic is they're very persistent. They just never go away. They're sitting in the waterways. They're sitting in the air. They just constantly are there. If you're ingesting them, um, they're very hard to get rid of. And so that's one of the reasons why they're very carcinogenic. Um, I, I have to say there are some counterpoints that people say about coal tar that it is less expensive. And in fact, it is. And Pat made a great point about the people who are using coal tar have a tendency to be the ones who may be a little bit less unscrupulous. You can actually put more water in a coal tar product and have it still stick for a short period of time and somebody doesn't know until you're gone, until they're gone, that that was not properly applied and bye bye and, and you've, you've left that, um, that job and, and somebody, somebody's just been, been stolen from. Um, so it, it's usually somewhere between, and you saying it could be as low as 1% to 8% on the additional cost for an asphalt emulsion. The reality is even asphalt emulsion or even asphalt um, pavers do not recommend coal tar being put on pavement because it dries the pavement out. It actually causes nano cracking in the pavement much faster than um, asphalt emulsion does. And asphalt emulsion has polymers in it. It allows the, the asphalt to be moisturized and it retains it retains its moisture and it actually prolongs the life further than what you see with coal tar. So we're actually getting contractors to use this product who do not um, have coal tar bans and they're finding that it, it benefits their business. So you're just taking a great step in the environmental direction and the safety of your constituents in your area. Um, there is a science that's behind the coal tar initiative and it's the people who are backing and selling coal tar still but they're growing ever more quiet because they realize that the argument for keeping this product around 
is just not a safe one. And liability is starting to raise for municipalities. There's lawsuits in Minnesota that have come across that are suing the coal tar industry for removing the high PAHs that are in some of their waterways, whether they're in retention ponds or otherwise, because that's where they have a tendency to collect. And now that this is coming out, it's very likely that over the, over the next five to 10 years, we're gonna start seeing potential lawsuits on whether it's cities and municipalities for not taking action and protecting their citizens. So it is something to be aware of that now that we know that this exists, um, that it could potentially become a bigger problem um, than what we see now as far as a legal and liability concern. Um, there, it, is, it is undisputable that the PAHs in sealants is linked to other PAHs in general, and that PAHs are highly known carcinogens. So I always say to people, there are other sealants that um, have a lower rate of uh, PAHs in them uh, that are not coal tar, they're hybrids. But I always tell clients as we're, they're making the choice between one or another, do you want some cancer or some carcinogens in your sealant, or would you like none? Because there are products out there like ours, like the one that Jay's using, that do not have any um, PAHs in them and actually in the end can protect your, your municipality and your constituents even better. And I, I think your initiative to go to 0.1% is a very um, responsible one for both your, your community and your uh, constituents. So um, if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer. Great. Thanks so much for your testimony, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Alder from the 10th. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Oh, just one second. Yeah. Mr. Richards. Well, I, I just have one thing to wrap up, and that, that's about enforcement because that comes up in every community um, that we've been engaged in. And uh, although this, penal this ordinance uh, before you tonight has a financial penalty, uh, we believe that the best and most lasting way to uh, carry out the, uh, the goals of this ordinance is to achieve voluntary compliance and marketplace compliance. And so uh, we will work with the city of Green Bay and um, anybody who the mayor designates uh, to make sure that we get word out to uh, your constituents and to the people who apply uh, sealant products around here to let them know that the uh, city of Green Bay has passed a ban on coal tar sealants. And uh, we hope and expect that uh, most people will obey the law once they know about it. And we will certainly work with you on that. Great. Thank you. Alder from the 10th. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, this might be for all of you. And I, I was at committee with um, and Liz and John when you gave your presentation. It was very, very thorough. Um, I just remember, well, you mentioned that Minnesota had banned it. Mm -hmm. And the state of Wisconsin, as far as you know, it, it has not been banned at the state level. It has not been banned at the state level. I know that they are working at that. Um, it was a bit slow going for the last couple of years, uh, and I, I think they do have some um, interest at the state level now. Um, but I, you know, like this, like anything, the state level is a little bit harder to move that ball down the road. I think um, you probably have a better answer for for that than I would. Yeah, and that kind of goes to the resolution that we're asking you to pass tonight to urge the legislature to pass a ban on coal tar sealant. Um, and, but we know that uh, our focus is on communities around the Lake Michigan coastline to make sure that, or in the, in the Lake Michigan watershed, to make sure that certainly the larger communities have passed a ban on coal tar sealant, regardless of what the legislature does. And if the legislature uh, does what we hope they do, um, that's all the better. But in the meantime, um, cities along uh, the Lake Michigan coastline and the watershed need to act. Well, I think that's a good point that you mentioned the, the lake shore communities. and. Uh, I'm just wondering how difficult initially this was, you know, just going after local communities to do this rather than the state, but that, that Yeah, I think they were able to move the ball a little quicker with the municipalities. One of the other things is, and we talked about this as, as they were expanding their reach, um, that it's the 80-20 rule. In these other commun in these communities, Milwaukee and Dane County, here in Green Bay, we can get 80% of the asphalt with less than 20% of the cities. And once people start making the switch, a lot of the applicators have 6,000, 8,000 gallon tanks in their yard and they're not going to fill it up with coal tar and then come fill it up with, with asphalt emulsion. Once they decide that this is the switch and they're going to be working in these municipalities, most of the sealants are going to turn over to an asphalt emulsion fairly quickly um, because there's just no sense in going back and forth. Is there any uh, way to uh, find out how many uh, of these um, businesses do this already in Wisconsin? Is there any kind of a handle uh, When on you that? say do this, you mean uh, lay you down? Applicate. Um, these applicators. You know, unfortunately, there's no licensing for this, and it's something that we've advocated for. We're looking to, to start a, um, a program where we actually are registering people who put down our sealant so that they're a certified applicator uh, because it can make a difference. But I think Pat's kind of alluded to that. 
Um, and, but I, I do think it would be a great licensing thing for the state. I, I think uh, licensing seal coders, there, it is a large industry. Um, it's not small potatoes, but it's not regulated like the asphalt business itself, like roadways. And okay. they don't have the same specifications. Sometimes with um, large municipal projects, they will have um, you know, mill thickness specifications on application, but um, it's very infrequent. Well, thank you for your testimony. That's all. Any other questions? Alder from the 11th. Thank you. I was wondering if you have addressed any of the distributors. Have you, have you talked to any of the distributors that are actually selling this product? Uh, what, um, is, what is their input as far as uh, their thoughts on the environmental problem that they're creating? So I've, I've talked to many distributors um, throughout the state. Uh, certainly some I do not want to make the switch. I mean, there's certainly um, applicators out there that are, are love coal tar. Um, for the most part, those, those applicators are people who have been in business for a long time are kind of ingrained in what they do. And I can't fault them for where they want to be with their business. Um, but I think it's, it's fairly consistent that they see this coming. Um, and most of them have started to either make a move from coal tar to a less of a coal tar pr product, a, um, a hybrid per se, where it's got 1.5% um, as opposed to point, you know, 0.1%. And so they're starting to make the, sh the shift. Uh, I also think that a lot of the applicators that are out there that are also distributing um, who have not been forced down this road, again, they, they've seen this coming and they're prepared for it to some degree. The cost of switching isn't really, it's a very nominal cost. You're basically talking about tips and, and, and changing the air pressure in your, in your rigs. So it's not a, uh, a high cost switchover. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this in the last meeting. Doing this in the winter time is kind of a nice thing because they don't have they are they don't have coal tar in their tanks right now that they have to worry about. Um, these these tanks are typically um, cleaned out here in the winter time, and um, they can kind of refill and be ready for the season next year. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I also mentioned though that most of the box stores no longer carry it. So Menards, Home Depot, Fleet Farm no longer carry it as well. Alder from the 12th. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for your presentation. How many suppliers in the Green Bay area are you familiar with that sell alternatives to coal tar? Um, I know there's one. Yeah, I'm one. <laughs> 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 um, there, uh, there are another supplier, or there's two suppliers that I know of that sell um, a lower grade of coal tar, a, a low, low coal tar type product. Um, but I, I don't know in Green Bay, there's not really a lot of distributors in this area, period. Um, there are some in Appleton in the, in the Fox Valley that do. Um, there's quite a bit in the Milwaukee region that do. Um, Dane County has a few. But again, most of the people who are using this project and distributing it, um, if it's not on a retail Menards basis, which almost every one of those, I don't know that they sell any coal tar in, in True Value, Menards, Home Depot, any of those, they, they, they've stopped selling this product uh, quite a while ago. Um, but it's the, the gentlemen who are using this product with a 6,000 gallon tank and they're using coal tar or they're using some other substitute. And I would say a third of the state is probably reasonable that have made the switch already um, in areas where they're not banned. Um, and I think it's a testament to how great the product is starting to become where these people are actually making the switch before they're forced to make the switch. Okay. Um. <coughs> Throughout the state, though, what, what, I guess what I'm looking to prevent, I, I think it's all a good idea, don't get me wrong, but what I'm looking to prevent is that enacting an ordinance and then uh, for folks in the area that want to seal their driveway and pavement that there's not enough suppliers to provide so, alternatives to. So the manufacturing piece is here already. All the manufacturers that manufacture coal tar in the in the region also manufacture asphalt emulsion. So the, the supply is there. They're buying this from a, from one of the suppliers already that has it available. All they really need to do is switch the material and they would have a tank filled as soon as the season starts. So it wouldn't be a supply issue. Can you would you support with that? No. I mean, you'd be able to get anything you need already. Is the cost of the alternatives substantially higher than the existing no, we were saying it's anywhere from one to eight percent. Um, I, I mean, there are premium products that you can add. You can put additives in and make it more costly and make it more powerful and make it uh, a longer lasting sealant. Um, but the baseline, just like coal tar, is usually one to eight percent. And then you're moving that onto a square footage of, 
under, you get 50 square feet per gallon, so the cost of the end consumer could be even less. Okay, thank you. Alder from the Knights. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so my question is similar to Alder Burnett's, but on the reverse end of the spectrum, and the concern that I, I have, and I would just like you to speak to it, um, is uh, stores, especially small stores, that might carry coal tar, and we've imposed a ban, and now we've left them with inventory that they can't do anything with. Mm -hmm. So is that a concern, or could you please speak to that? Um, I do not know of any retail outlets that are selling coal tar anymore and haven't for some time. I could be mistaken. It could be mm -hmm. there. Um, this isn't a statewide ban yet, and, and certainly in your area you're not banning coal tar sales. You're just saying you can't put it down in Green Bay. Um, so potentially that could stop some sales here in Green Bay, I would be surprised. I mean, yeah, we, we actually are banning sales. Yes. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I thought so, to be the case. Right. Oh, okay. So, it's okay. Some areas that but what we, what we found in our surveys around the state, and to the extent we've done surveys in Green Bay, this is borne out that, um, as Jim mentioned, the big box stores aren't carrying it anymore. Um, when we've gone to the more locally owned Ace Hardware stores and other things like that, what we found uh, around the state is that they aren't carrying it any either. So um, I'm really not aware of any retail in, this, in the communities that we've been in, and we've been in a bunch of them so far, we haven't run into any problem where after we enacted an ordinance, uh, uh, some retailer says, well, I have all this stock on hand, what am I gonna do with it? That just has not come up. What is the shelf life of that product? Of coal tar? Yes. Probably, probably a long time, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so, so and, and even from your experience when you have distributors of coal tar, do they, I mean, they usually go by a region as opposed to just, hey, I'm in Green Bay and I'm distributing exclusively in Green Bay. Yes. It's usually someone who has a much broader Correct. footprint yeah. so that if we did ban it in Green Bay, that they still have other communities they could distribute their product to. They could, you know, until the state passed the ban. Right. right. And again, they wouldn't have any product on hand. Um, because most, if not all, I don't know anybody who's storing these things inside. So at the end of winter time, those tanks freeze and they're getting rid of the, the waste prior to it freezing out uh, for the most part. I mean, there may be somebody who's got some, but for the most part, people who are selling this material are not keeping it in storage over the winter. So it's not an inventory product. It's more of like a just-in-time kind Correct. of process. Correct. It's more of a just-in-time, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alder. Alder from the 12th yes. for a second time. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the you all seem like fine gentlemen, so I'm going to word out my question. So I don't mean to, I don't, I don't mean to come off as being offensive or to question your character or ethics. But if I'm Mr. Coltar and I'm believe in that product, mm -hmm. and I see individuals here who, at one level, would benefit from alternatives economically, business would benefit from the sale and distribution of alternatives to cold. I know it's difficult in that you seem to be very passionate and knowledgeable of the alternatives and coal tar. So I understand that when things like this come up before the public and policy is enacted or changed or amended, obviously you have people who are experts in the field who are very passionate. And so I guess if I were to play the devil's advocate and be very much aligned with the coal tar industry, which I am not, the criticism we could have would be that, well, you're hearing from people who are going to benefit. Like, how do you, how do we get around that? Can I just address yes. that? And it, that, that's a fair question. Clean Wisconsin and Lakeshore Natural Resources Partnership um, uh, really started this campaign a couple of years ago because we were concerned about the environmental and public health impacts of this. As, I, as you see in the materials I handed out to you, the American Medical Association has sided with us because of the significant public health concern. Children's Hospital in Milwaukee has sided with us because of the health concerns to children. Ascension Wisconsin, another statewide uh, healthcare system, has uh, written in support of these bans in Wisconsin for the public health concerns. But I think uh, for all of us who care about uh, Lake Michigan and the Bay of Green Bay and the waters leading into them, who all of us know, grew up with hearing about PCBs and DDTs, know how bad that was, and know as a society it took us a couple of generations to figure out that those things were bad. And it wasn't because people were evil and they were spreading a product they thought was bad, it's because we just didn't know. But now we have an increasingly large body of 
peer-reviewed evidence in, in legitimate scientific journals showing how toxic PAHs are, how they are contaminating our waterways, and how coal tar sealant is by far and away the leading contributing factor. So we brought these gentlemen here tonight just to answer a number of technical questions that are beyond our expertise because they're in it every day and they can, they can uh, talk in some detail uh, about uh, the day-to-day -day work with these different products. But there's a much, there's also a, a really important public health and environmental discussion that we're having uh, and certainly um, in this part of the state about uh, an, an environmental hazard that we recognize and how we can address it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, sir, if you, you'd like to say your name and your address. Sure. Um, my name is Andrew Waterman, and I live on 1222 Hastings Street. And I'm a Green Bay public school teacher, and I work with three- and four-year-old um, Head Start kids. So I'm interested about the playgrounds that I play on. And so, I mean, I don't know anything about the, the stuff about this, but I do know about how my students play on the playground. And so I'm wondering if if we can test our playgrounds or if we can cover them up as well. But I don't want to make a big panic thing either. I'm really more interested in having this banned so it doesn't go on new playgrounds like uh, Head Start will be building a new parking lot and playground over at Jefferson School this year. Um, I work at the uh, Head Start Learning Center that just got remodeled. That used to be the extension office. So anyway, that's what I'm really interested in having the ban for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any further questions from Alders? Entertain a motion to close the floor. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, second by Alder from the 11th to close the floor. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. And we have uh, a motion and a second to adopt here. Any further discussion on the item? Alder from the 9th. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Director Grenier, just a couple of questions for you because I, I feel like you would be the in-house resident expert on, on some of this stuff. So the, the scientific uh, stuff that's contained in there, for example, the 0.1% PAH that was brought up, do you know what that means and is that the right number? I don't, I don't know if it's the right number. If it's something that's in a published document, we're going to have to assume that it was properly tested. Uh, I'm not ex the expert on coal tar, but I've got about 29 years worth of experience dealing with polycyclical aromatic hydrocarbons, so I can speak pretty, pretty de in, in depth about PAH. <clears throat> the asphalt-based uh, driveway, and primarily what these folks have been talking about have been asphalt, oh, for lack of a better term, parking lot type sealants, okay? The stuff is also used in built up roofing compounds and things like that. So there, there's a little bit more to it than just, uh, just the wide open spaces that people park on, although that is the highest volume uh, that, that's utilized. Um, one of the things that has been referenced in the documents that I've seen tonight uh, are the asphalt emulsions. and. I've personally been using SS1H emulsions for well in excess of 20 years, and they, they work fantastic. So again, from our end of things and how we see things at DPW, this is really not a concern because we haven't used these types of materials in a long time. Uh, I was a little concerned that there may be some of this stuff in the crack sealant, but our crack sealants are a combination of rubber, uh, silicone, and asphalt-based uh, type things, so we're good on that on that respect. Um, the table data that I've seen so far, it seems to make sense. Uh, again, I can't independently verify the accuracy, but what they're portraying to you does seem to be in the ballpark. I don't, I don't think that's out of the order. Or I would not question the data they put together, let's put it that way. Okay. And then uh, you've been careful to note that DPW doesn't have an objection to this. I don't know if that's intentional or otherwise, but specifically my question is, from the private sector, uh, are you aware of companies within the within the city that currently use this product? I'm not personally aware of them, and there there, there wasn't uh, there, there wasn't any intent by me saying DPW. I'm I'm strictly looking okay. at things that are under my control. Um, I have anecdotally heard 
you know, again, in the roofing industry, that there are folks who uh, have used this in built up asphalt type uh, or composite type roofing systems uh, in the past, and that it's uh, coal tar has been around for a long time. Uh, so it, it's kind of ubiquitous. And again, we support, we think it's the right move to be taking the action uh, to, to move away from them. The, there are alternatives on the market which are much safer for the, uh, there, there are alternatives on the market which are much safer for the environment, much safer for human health and welfare. Uh, again, that's why we are in strong support of uh, a move away from coal tar based. Okay, and so when we look at, um, and I'm not trying to necessarily debate that particular point, which I think is a very important one, because sometimes you make decisions that cost more, but it's but it's you know for the mm -hmm. for the good of the community. But it's just one of those things that I do want to have a transparent discussion about, and specifically when we do subcontract work uh, that uses uh, you know, whatever product. I mean, do you, do you? Do you think or, or do you perceive that there would possibly be an increase in cost from subcontractors uh, through the elimination of this product? Do you see, for, I mean, kind of foresee that happening or, is, or do you feel that most of the subcontractors we use are already using uh, the alternative product? Boy, I would really like to think that most people are already using these. Um, I presume that if we make this change, that would be dictated in the specifications? Absolutely. That, that's a real easy thing for us to do is simply add the language indicating that coal tar-based uh, components are prohibited within the city of Green Bay and on our contracts. So that, that's real easy for us. Okay. And do we do any level of inspection right now uh, to determine if somebody, or would we? Uh, because if, if we ban this, um, would we have any type of inspection process to determine if somebody is using coal tar? Uh, on, on our projects, we would. Um, I think at a staff level, we're going to have to have a little bit more discussion as to, as to how the enforcement on private projects is going to go. But one of the things that we require from contractors on public construction contracts, um, they are required to turn in submittals on all materials that are incorporated into the work and for us to do a, a search on either coal tar uh, containing or PAH loading uh, on those, those types of materials that are being incorporated in the construction is very easy for us to do. Okay. Um, and then actually I just have one last question that's for legal. Do we have legal here? Oh, sorry, Vanessa, you're... Uh, <laughs> Um, when I'm looking under the, the penalties, um, can it's not very clear to me, but it basically says uh, it, there's penalties for a daily offense. What constitutes a daily offense when it comes to the use of this product? Like, does if somebody's using it, do they have to remove it? And is it a daily offense for every day that they don't remove it, or do we do they just have to stop using the product? I guess I'm trying to understand that. So. Homeowner comes in, redoes their driveway with car, yeah, with with this sealant. Do they have to take it out? Yes. So generally, the way we enforce these is if you if the problem is that you've used it, then the fact that it has continued to exist is the is the what is ultimately um, problematic. And so the citations are based on the fact that it continues to exist at any point in time. And so every day that it continues to stay in that state, similar to like an inspections issue, if, if you. <coughs> Um, haven't repainted your house even though you were supposed to, they'll come back and set you for the same thing because you're allowing it to exist in that state. Okay, so when I'm reading this language then, um, let me see, each day of violation shall constitute a separate offense. In your legal opinion, does that adequately describe the explanation you just gave me? I just want to be sure that we've got language in there that sufficiently uh, protects the city. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's all I have for questions. I do support. Uh, I do support this ordinance. Thanks, Alder. Any further discussion? Alder from the sixth. I definitely support this as we're, I think uh, the gentleman that came up and talked about the children, and people have to be aware that children are m much more susceptible to all these pollutants and carcinogens. I can't say it. Can't. Cancer causing agents <laughs> and um, any any of these uh, chemicals, they're so much more susceptible to it, and that's why we ban you know like the lead, 
um, PCBs, um, asbestos. We had so many that we banned, and they were cheap. They were a lot cheaper to use than the alternatives, but we banned them because of the adverse health, it, you know, things. So I definitely support this. Okay. Thanks, Alder. Alder from the 7th. Thank you, Honor. I just want to thank uh, everyone that came and spoke on this. I know they came and spoke at our committee, and some of them have come a long way, and it's really appreciated. Uh, I think your knowledge and your input has been uh, great. Uh, it helped me a lot, even though I was already on board. I'm just 10 feet higher or more on board. <laughs> with all the knowledge you shared with me, it, it's really helpful, and I really want to thank you. Thanks, Alder. Alder from the 12th. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yes, I, I agree with all their scandal completely, which doesn't always happen. <laughs> but um, the gentleman really presented something of great value, and I'm just so very grateful that people and organizations are moving forward on these sorts of things. 20, 30, even 10, maybe five years ago, there wasn't a push. We were not as knowledgeable of these sorts of things, or perhaps we didn't have the courage to move forward. And so I very grateful um, know a lot of people who are affected by different sorts of cancers and ailments and if we can identify something that is known to cause such things and we could properly eliminate that and not only that but also know that there are alternatives uh, I think is a very good thing and then we can also further look at things like herbicides and pesticides things that are destroying wildlife and getting into our water supply and our food supply. So thank you for everyone who, who um, were involved in this process, and I am an enthusiastic yes on this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. And with that, Alder from the 10th. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I had the privilege of being at the meeting as well and heard the entire presentation and as well as tonight. So I kudos to you for traveling all this distance. I concur it's, I feel it's a slam dunk so uh, thank you for all your research on this many times with us alders you know we need a little time sometimes to vet these things and look things over we don't have a tremendous amount of time but I think with your presentation and with the uh, the alders speaking to this I think it's uh, a great great thing so thank you I'm in support thank you Alder. so we have the motion on the floor in a second all in favor Please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. Thank you to our guests for attending as well. Now on to item three. The motion has been made to receive and place on file by Alder from the 9th. Second. Seconded by Alder from the 10th. Discussion? Alder? Thank you, Mayor. Um, the reason I made the motion that I did on this particular item really has nothing to do with the merits of the discussion that we just had. In fact, I think the discussion we just had was a very important one, and in particular, while well, I said that I supported uh, the creation of the ordinance, I think it really has to do with, obviously, public health concerns. It has to do with, uh, I think we have very minimal risk in that uh, particular situation with the impact to the business community and to city taxpayers. So. Again, when I when I when I look at the creating of uh, the creation of the resolution for a statewide ban, my my primary objection or concerns about this is advoc advocating for a state change without the knowledge of state needs, and I think that's ultimately why I, I oppose the resolution. I think uh, you know we've supported resolutions here that directly impact the residents of Green Bay, who we are elected to represent. Uh, we can support resolutions that uh, advocate to bring support back to our community, um, but this one uh, does neither of those. And we've sent the message by creating the ordinance that the city of Green Bay supports a ban on this. We've sent that message. We've created the ordinance. Of course, we have to go through a couple public hearings yet, but, uh, but the passage today, I think, already achieves what this resolution is intended to do. Um, approving this resolution asserts that we are statewide experts on this issue, and, and I think there's a very dangerous precedence to be set when the city of Green Bay lends its name to support public interests. And public interests are not a bad thing. In fact, in most cases, it's a very important thing. But I think we have to take a look at how does it positively impact the residents of the city of Green Bay. And as I said, because we've already made the decision to ban this locally, um, I, I think we've sent that message. 
Uh, I personally feel ill-equipped to decide in the absence of that state knowledge in terms of what's best for the state of Wisconsin. Our jurisdiction is the city of Green Bay, uh, and that is who I am elected to represent. It is for that reason, uh, again, that I, I feel like this is an issue that's better taken up by state elected officials. Thank you, Alder. Alder from the 7th. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, I support this, and I, I, I couldn't disagree more. Uh, our state reps, I do question some of their actions sometimes, but I do believe they're, you know, they're, they're not idiots. They're smart. They, they know what they're doing. This is a non-binding resolution. It forces them to do nothing. It tells them this is an issue. This is a concern. This still affects us. We've taken care of Green Bay, but we're surrounded by communities that haven't passed this. Waterways, no, no geographic boundaries. This is something that still concerns us. This is still something good for us if the state uh, takes this on. And I believe when the state takes it on, uh, they will do their due diligence just as we've done ours, and they will act responsibly. I think to uh, throw in our two cents to get their motor moving is well worth our two cents. And uh, it, this still affects us. Uh, as I said, surrounding communities, uh, have not passed an ordinance. We don't know if they will pass an ordinance. Uh, waterways, no, no municipal boundaries. And so uh, this is something that still concerns me uh, as a Green Bay citizen and uh, as a Wisconsinite. I might move, and I would like to know that my state is taking care of these. I mean, there's, there's no reason to have these carcinogens in our environment. There's just no argument that, that holds it up. Uh, and. Uh, uh, as we've heard, the industry is changing kind of on its own. It certainly would be nice to give it a nudge to uh, make that uh, transition complete. I think locally, definitely, and uh, na as, uh, as a state, uh, it would also be very positive for us as Green Bayites. So I support uh, sending this on to the state. And I don't know if we need to open the floor and hear from those who have spoke, uh, if they would like to throw in their two cents on this. Uh, we've heard from them on the on the on the uh, ordinance. They did mention the the uh, resolution a little. I don't know if there's more they need to say or would like to say. Um, the Alder from the first. Certainly. Yep. Thank you. I I definitely support um, s uh, sending this resolution to the state legislation. I think that our opinions are very important, and I think they're important too the legislators that represent us at the state level. Um, I do care about the quality of the water. I have grandchildren. This planet is for the future. It's, it's not just for us to use. And so I want to make sure that, that the, the state of Wisconsin is supporting the best legislation to ensure that carcinogens are kept out of our waterways and that people are safer. Um, I think this would be very a very valuable resolution to send to the state, so I will vote against receive in place on file. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder from the 6th. I also will support this resolution. I believe as um, Alder Scanlon and Alder Dorf had mentioned, this is very important to let our state legislators know our opinions. And I think as a city, we have more clout than if individually, you know, people would contact our legislators, and they do listen to us as a collective um, group of people. I think we have a little bit more clout, and I would definitely support this, and I thank the other two alders for their, um, whatever, their discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder from the 12th. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. The uh, motion is to receive and place on file, so I think we need to be clear on what we'd be voting for. Uh, I just am a little concerned with the inconsistency in the language. Uh, the top of the document is resolution in support of state leg legislation regulating, and then at the very bottom, the action line, now therefore therefore be it resolved that the Common Council, Green Bay, you know, so on and so forth, uh, urges the governor and state legislature to enact the le legislation banning so on the, the heading of the resolution, it says we're, we're in support of legislation regulating, and I think is a little different than banning. So wh whatever the de council decides, these resolutions, we, we've we uh, voted on these th in the past. We forwarded them to state government, federal government. Whether they're effective, change opinion, who knows? They don't hurt, obviously, um, if we're all in agreement. But that's the one thing I would 
I would ask a little consistency in. So whoever drafted that, if I don't know if the city attorney's office did, but why is why is that a little different? Is that a question? Yeah, if I, if you could, Mayor Attorney Chavez. It's probably just uh, wording that was picked, so I'm not sure if it was pulled from prior um, ordinances. I didn't actually, I wasn't the person who drafted it, but I, I imagine that there, it was just a typo. Um, but either way, um, regulating it and banning it, banning it would have the effect of regulating it. Thank you, Alder. Further discussion? The motion before us is to receive and place on file. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposed, nay? Nay. Motion fails. Motion to approve. Second. Motion made by Alder from the seventh, seconded by Alder from the first to approve. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay? nay? The ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. We are now back to item L, report of the Redevelopment Authority. Motion to approve. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 1st to approve Report L, which is the Report of the Redevelopment Authority from the meeting on December 10, 2019. All in, f all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The item has been adopted. To item M, Report of the Improvement and Services Committee. Motion to approve. Second. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 1st to approve Report M. Report of the INS Committee, December 10, 2019. What was the item to be held separately, Alder? Two. Two. Any other items? <coughs> <coughs> item two will be handled separately. Hearing none others, all in favor of the approving the remainder of that report, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The report has been approved with the exception of item two. Second. Motion made by Alder from the sev seventh, seconded by Alder from the fourth. The item was pulled by the Alder from the ninth. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Director Grenier, and I, I'm just trying to stretch my memory on this, it, if, if this was the action that we took at committee, uh, but it says within uh, the item here to approve, uh, to develop and implement a five-year plan. Uh, my recollection, and you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong, was that the plan was going to be drafted and brought back to committee, but as I read this motion, it would be implemented with an affirmative vote today. Director? This was the, the recollection that uh, the assistant director and I had, but if, if you want to amend that for, to bring it back, to have the, the plan brought back to council, that's your prerogative. Okay, and then maybe a, a further point of clarification. Was this going to require uh, an ordinance change? No. Should it? We're talking about number two, correct? Correct. The sidewalk program? Yep. No. I would not I would not see this as an ordinance change this is simply a, a line item within the capital improvement program I'm looking at Vanessa is this something that I mean we, we are essentially being proactive now with inspecting sidewalks and requesting our residents to replace at their expense those sidewalk cakes that are their responsibility should that require an ordinance change no, it doesn't. So the, an ordinance change would be required if we were changing the standards that we were going to be adopting or um, new requirement, like if we were suddenly requiring that they take responsibility for the, for the sidewalks. But the sidewalk responsibility is already there. Um, we're just changing the frequency at which it's going to be happening. Okay, thank you. And, and I just... We, we talked about this at length at, at committee. Um, I had a lot of my questions answered there. I do support this program. I just wanted to be clear that we were implementing it in an appropriate fashion. So thank you for answering those questions. Thank you, Alder. Further questions or discussion? Alder from the 12th? Yes. Um, thank you, Mayor. I believe I voted no at committee, and it, it's, it's not a vote against the, the plan or the idea. I think my reasoning at that time was the cost of the plan you know three hundred thousand dollars when we have you know tight budgets I, I don't know how we would come up with that amount of money on a yearly basis so the plan is one thing I think we all anyone with common sense anyways would understand that sidewalks in this city and some neighborhoods are in very bad condition and they're a public safety issue uh, but it's the the cost to 
do this on a yearly basis that I'm concerned about. So I just don't want to put something forward with the false expectation that money's just going to appear to make this happen. I'd like to know that we have a viable financial uh, uh, you know the word I'm looking for. But anyway, so that would be my main concern. So could the finance director or someone uh, maybe in public works, Mr. Grenier, mention, uh, discuss how the funding of this would would come into play director Grenier certainly this uh, like other projects that we do during the course of the the year it's a capital program so it becomes part of the capital improvement program uh, and becomes part of the available money that uh, that comes to DPW through the bond request okay thank you I um, I'd be in favor of voting in favor of this given that um, the CIP program we vote on we form and vote on every year and we can then look at the financial ramifications at that time but this at least puts it uh, in front of us and and something that we can go back to thank you mayor thanks Alder any further discussion All right, we have a motion on the floor in a second all in favor please signify by saying aye aye those opposed nay the ayes have it the motion is adopted on to item O, report of the Protection and Policy Committee granting operator licenses. Approved. Motion made by Alder from the seventh, seconded by Alder from the second to approve report O, which is the report of the Protection and Policy Committee granting operator licenses. Any names for which you'd like to be uh, listed as abstaining? Okay. Any names under this report you wish to handle separately? Hearing none, all in favor of the report, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The report has been approved. On to report P, uh, item P, report of the park committee. All right. Um, motion. Motion, motion made by Alder from the fourth, second by Alder from the seventh to approve report P. Um, item one has been pulled by Alder from the ninth. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we had discussed this item at committee level for those uh, who aren't overly familiar. Um, and, and certainly, Director Ditch, I'm sure, will speak to this. But my major concern is that we were, uh, uh, Parks Department was asking us to allocate $51,418 to replace the computer panel with something that uh, we can have ownership rights of, um, really because of a customer service issue, um, someone who has a patent that. Uh, is no longer able to return calls in a timely manner, not necessarily because there was an immediate need to replace the item. And so uh, one of the things I'd asked uh, at committee level for Director Ditchite to look into was the city's ability to perhaps purchase the patent or purchase a license uh, to gain access to the use of that, uh, to the existing computer system, which could perhaps be a more affordable option than replacing the entire system. So I would just be looking to Director Ditchite to provide us an update uh, with the outcome of that outreach. Director? Yeah, so I did some research into that topic. Uh, so there is no patent on this uh, software. It was created by an individual or, or a company with one individual employed there. And uh, upon uh, creating the, the document or the program, basically he gets a copyright of it. Uh, in the state of Wisconsin, that copyright uh, lasts, my understanding of copyright law in Wisconsin is that it lasts uh, 70 years beyond the, the lifetime of the individual that wrote the program. So the copyright will still be valid on the program for a substantial amount of time here. As far as uh, looking at purchasing a license, uh, this person uh, who, who ran, the, who created the program, uh, he is very adamant that uh, he would like to have control of that program uh, to be able to view it and uh, not allow access to the city or to others to uh, basically view that program to be able to diag diagnose the problems uh, when they come up. So he has a copyright on it for 70 years. What exactly does that mean? Well, basically what that means, I mean, I, I'd have to kind of maybe point to the law department for, you know, clarification on copyright laws. But in essence, he created the program. Uh, there are fi firewalls in the program preventing us from uh, viewing uh, the software. 
so every time we run into a problem uh, with the with the ride, whether it's a small problem or a big problem, if there's any problem at all, the ride automatically shuts down. Uh, we can't get it back in service until somebody goes into the program, looks at the code that uh, that was hit, uh, which caused the problem, and then that code will tell us what needs to be fixed uh, to to repair the ride. So as long as there's firewalls, you know, written into the program, uh, we cannot access it without his uh, written approval and his support in that. Okay, um, Vanessa, question then on, on the copyright issue. Does this, I mean, is this just prohibit us from, from distributing or, or, I mean, do we have any access or any ownership rights over to a product that has a copyright? Like, so if the, if, if the system breaks down, as Director Ditchite had said, there's a firewall in the way, do we, do we have the right to go around that firewall and fix, fix the problem of the software that we own? Just a little reminder to, to use, uh, formal salutations and last names. So, Attorney yes. Chavez. So the way copyright works is um, what we generally see is a license. And so what will happen is somebody will draft something. Um, they get As soon as it's drafted, they automatically are, retain copyrights to it. It's not like trademark where you have to get it registered. It's just as soon as you create an artistic work or a work um, in general that it is considered copyrighted. Um, and so in this case, when you have software um, such as this here, what happens is somebody will issue a license to it, which is imagine what we have, but then it's a limited license allowing us to use it, but not necessarily do anything with the code. It's like when you get a, a software, um, if you get Adobe Acrobat, you're getting a license to use it. So that's essentially what we have. We don't own it. We don't have any ownership rights into it. Um, we just get to use it. So if I'm understanding everything correctly, it's not that we would be using this property anymore, it's that we'd basically be getting a new software altogether. And that new person has full reign to do whatever they want because it's the software that they wrote. And so it would be completely irrelevant whether or not the, the, the original copyright stays with the original owner because we're not going to be using it anymore. Okay, so with, with the copyright in place right now, we do not have access to repair it when it goes down. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alder. Alder from the first. Thank you, Mayor. I, I would just say I, did, I watched the parks this afternoon. The video was great. And <laughs> um, I would say that if paying $51,000, which isn't even from the city budget, it's from the Bay Beach budget, right? Right? That's correct. And to know that the Zip and Pippin will run when we need it to, like they described it being down five days in a row during the summer. And that's not good. That's losing money for the city. I think this is a really good deal, and I'm going to vote in favor of this. Thank you. Thanks, Alder. Uh, Alder from the 10th. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, this is for Director Ditchite. Uh, this person that owns the copyright, uh, do, does he have support staff in case he's not available, or how, can you ex describe that if we needed extra help on this? My understanding is that uh, the owner is the only employee, and, and his wife also assists with the company. So what would happen if, if he was not available, or how, how would that work? Uh, basically the ride is down until we hear back from him and he's able to remotely access the computer software to diagnose the problem. Uh, in the past there's been I, I would say progressively throughout the years it has be become more and more difficult to get a, a timely response from this individual. Uh, he recently took another job and that, that has uh, affected his schedule. So it has been several days uh, that where we've been waiting for, to hear from him. Well, I don't know. That, that just a, that's a bit of a concern that I would have if, if this is down for any period of time, even though this person does own, own this. You know, that, that's just a concern I would have. Now, I, I do want to add also that uh, the new software that we're looking at purchasing is from a company with several employees. I believe that there's uh, four employees who, who are capable of diagnosing, diagnosing the problem. 
Uh, in addition, the software that we're looking at purchasing, our own maintenance crews will have access to that software. Uh, so that's written into the, into the quote. So we will be able to diagnose the problem for most of the small issues that come up on our own without even having to call them. And then when we do need to reach out to them, uh, they have four individuals on staff that can help us. Okay, so. well that, that helps, thank you. Thank you, Alder, Alder from the 8th. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to clarify, is there a motion on the floor? Because we sent it here without a recommendation. So I, I'm just going to make a motion to approve the recommendation that we purchase this. Very good. Second. Right, uh, Second by Alder from the 1st. Yeah, and, and I appreciate looking for more information. We, we tried to find another way around it, but, you know, the Zip and Pippins are a prime attraction, and we can't have it down for long periods of time. This person seems more and more dis disinterested in helping us in a timely manner, so time to cut ties. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder from the 6th. I just have a quick question from um, Director Aditchite. Will this be both of the, uh, the cars running? So... So what we're replacing is the, the programming for the ride. So the computer and hardware and software and then the programming that's associated with it. Um, the uh, issue with operating one train or two train is, is kind of independent of this programming issue. Uh, it, we will, for now, uh, we're, our plan is to keep it with one train. Um, and we can look to uh, bumping it up to two trains in the future, but for now, um, we're going to go with one train. Okay. So, so you think that, so you think this program would help with having the, the second one running eventually? I, I think, um, I would say either program uh, can can work with the two trains. Uh, it's it's more of an issue in the fact that um, when we had that concern the last time with the two two trains, we weren't able to diagnose what the problem was. Uh, so until we're able to diagnose what the problem was, we're going to s keep with one train. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alder. Any further comments? All right, we do have a motion on the floor and a second to uh, approve the request to purchase a control system hardware retrofit for the Zip and Pippin. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. We're on to item Q, report of the personnel committee. <clears throat> Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 4th to approve report Q, which is the report of the personnel committee from the meeting on December 10, 2019. Any items here to be handled separately? I don't have to. <laughs> item 6 will be handled separately. Hearing none others, all in favor of approving the remainder of that report, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The report has been approved with the exception of oh, motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 2nd to approve item 6. Item was pulled by Alder from the 8th. Uh, yeah, I would make a motion to go into closed session. Okay. okay. Motion made to go into closed session uh, by Alder from the 8th, seconded by Alder from the 7th. i read language. Sure, definitely. The Common Council may convene closed session pursuant to 19.851E Wisconsin statutes for purpose of deliberating or negotiating public employee contracts for competitive or bargaining reasons. The Common Council may thereafter reconvene in open session pursuant to 19.852 Wisconsin statutes to report the results of the closed session and consider the balance of the agenda. It is a Motion to return to regular order of business. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 1st. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. We are back uh, to regular order of business. And we had a motion on the floor, I believe, yeah. to approve. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The item has been approved. We are to report, or item R rather, report of the Economic Development Authority. 
Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 9th to approve Report R, which is a report of the Economic Development Authority from the meeting on December 9, 2019. Any items to be handled separately? Number one. Item one. Any others? Item one will be handled separately. Hearing none others, all in favor of approving the remainder of that report, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The report has been approved with the exception of item one. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 9th to approve. This item was pulled by the Alder from the 6th. Um, this is just a note I want to make. It's not, I do not want to go to closed session. I just want to mention that this item would directly relate to the uh, presentation by Julie Norick. I think we need to look at uh, when there's anything with wetlands um, that we have to very well be cons um, aware of that these are so important with our drainage and everything and if this project you know fills in too much of that then we're going to have some issues again so we need to definitely look at what she presented that's all I want to bring up so I'm hoping that um, the staff will look at that Very thank good. you thank you all there director Vonk anything to note there uh, sure, yes. Um, staff is very well aware, I think, you know, between our ordinances and working with the DNR, um, there, there's some areas that we just are not going to be able to develop and nor do we want to develop. Um, and that will be something to, to be discussed as we move forward with that. So thank you. Thank you, Director. All right, seeing no other requests to speak. Motion, motion may, yeah. yeah. The motion has been made to approve. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The item has been approved. On to S, report of the plan commission. Approved. Second. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, second by Alder from the 2nd to approve report S, S, which is the report of the plan commission from the meeting on December 16, 2019. Any items to be handled separately here? All right. Hearing none, all in favor of approving that report, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Report has been approved. On to T, report of the sustainability commission. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 6th to approve Report T, which is the Report of the Sustainability Commission from the meeting on December 11, 2019. All, right. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The report has been approved. On to you. Receive and place on file. Motion to receive and place on file. Second. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 4th to receive and place on file the Municipal Court and Building Permit Reports for November 2019. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving that report, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The report has been received and placed on file. On to resolutions. You may under suspension of the rules adopt resolutions one through four together with one roll call vote. Motion made by Alder from the seventh, seconded by Alder from the sixth to suspend the rules to take up these items with one roll call vote. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Resolu the rules have been. Oh. Alder from the ninth. It, it, if uh, the alder from the six would be willing to uh, suspend just items two through four, suspend the rule for items two through four, and handle item one separately. Motion made by alder from the sixth, seconded by. Can, can we do that, Chris? Can I just say no on number one? You can do that, and I'll. You want it notated? Sure. Yes. Okay. okay. That's all I. That's all I wanted. So. Just noted, so the rules have been suspended. Yes. Then I'm good. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion to adopt resolutions one adopt. through four. Second. Seconded by Alder. Motion made by Alder from the seventh. Seconded by Alder from the first to adopt resolutions one through four. Please use the board. Those pass 11 0 with uh, the note on item one for the alder from the ninth. On to ordinances first reading. You may enter suspension of the rules, advance ordinances one and two to a second reading. <laughs> Motion made by alder from the ninth, seconded by alder from the seventh to suspend the rules, take up these items with one roll call vote. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. The rules are suspended. Motion Motion made by alder from the seventh, seconded by alder from the eighth to advance items one and two to second and final reading. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Opposed nay. The ayes have it and they have been advanced to final reading. Referral of petitions and communications. Alder from the 8th. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have one for, or two. One, first one for improvement services. Appeal by Bob Corey, 302 Oak to the reinspection fees on his property. Second one's INS and Planning Commission. Appeal by Mike and Karen Alberts, 1801 South Ridge, to the designation and approved uses of their parcels. And then I list the parcel numbers. Thanks. Thank you, Alder. Alder from the first. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's This one, I think, should be directed to finance. Um, to appeal the 2018 increased tax bill for 2884 Sussex Road for Todd Bardouche. The city made an error on the 2018 and 19 taxes. The homeowner brought this to the attention of the city, but because he built the home, he thought he was only under charge for 2019. Found out he was under charge for 2018 as well. So I'm appealing that on his behalf. Thank you, Alder. Any other communications? Clerk, any late communications? No, I do not. I'll entertain a motion. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 5th to refer all late petitions and communications to the proper authority. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. You guys have it. Motion made by Alder from the 7th, seconded by Alder from the 10th to adjourn. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, happy new year. All right. In that order? That's right. I think so. <laughs> Wait a second, I'm going to do a new year. <laughs> I don't know. Everybody's got an opinion.